Thanks everyone for joining us and welcome to the Cancer Research Institute's webinar series, Breakthroughs in Cancer Immunotherapy. Today's date is Thursday, November 12, 2015. The title for today's webinar is Immunotherapy for Lung Cancer, PD-1 and Beyond. In this webinar, we will discuss current immunotherapy treatment options for patients with lung cancer, as well as several promising immunotherapy treatments on the horizon. Today's webinar is made possible through the generous support of Bristol-Myers Squibb. Bristol-Myers Squibb is a global biopharmaceutical company whose mission is to discover, develop, and deliver innovative medicines that help patients prevail over serious diseases. BMS is a leader in the development of immunotherapy for cancer, with two FDA-approved immunotherapies that have been shown to be effective in melanoma and lung cancer. For more information about Bristol-Myers Squibb, visit www.bms.com. I'd also like to thank our partners at Longevity and Free to Breathe, two nonprofit organizations committed to increasing survivorship among lung cancer patients. We're grateful for their help in getting the word out about today's webinar on lung cancer immunotherapy. My name is Brian Brewer, and I'm Director of Marketing and Communications at the Cancer Research Institute. Cancer Research Institute is the world's only nonprofit organization devoted exclusively to harnessing the immune system's power to conquer all forms of cancer. We fund scientists around the world whose work has led to significant breakthroughs in treating cancer with immunotherapy. Over the next 45 minutes, you'll have an opportunity to hear firsthand from an immunotherapy expert on how lung cancer treatment today is undergoing a revolution thanks to these breakthroughs. After a 25-minute presentation from our speaker, we will open the discussion to questions submitted by you. You can pose your questions at any time throughout the webinar by typing in the Q&A box on your screen, or you can tweet your questions to us using at cancer research and the hashtag CRI webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the CRI website and on our YouTube channel. Now it's my pleasure to welcome today's expert speaker. Dr. Naya Rizvi is the Director of Thoracic Oncology and Director of Immunotherapeutics at Columbia University Medical Center. He is an internationally recognized leader in the treatment of lung cancer and immunotherapy drug development and played a significant role in the FDA approval of a new class of immunotherapies called immune checkpoint inhibitors for melanoma and lung cancer. We're very grateful that he could take time out of this busy day to join us. Thank you, Dr. Rizvi, and welcome. Thanks, Brian. I'm happy to be here and uh, discuss uh, the new advances in lung cancer. So I'm going to go ahead and, and really try to provide a, a comprehensive overview of um, how we've gotten to today and, and where we are going in the future. Um, I think that um, there's a lot of um, excitement and I'd like to really give, where, give you an overview of where the data is at um, today. So just as some uh, background information in terms of how we approach non-small cell lung cancer, um, ideally we'd like to be able to catch this disease when it is at an earlier stage where we can perform um, resection of a tumor and so optimally for stage one and two lung cancer, um, we uh, would recommend surgery for those patients that are um, operable. Um, stage uh, one is a tumor that's isolated to the lung with no evidence of lymph node spread. Stage um, two is where the first level of lymph nodes are affected. And in those patients, we would um, uh, typically give surgery and uh, combination with chemotherapy, primarily adjuvant chemotherapy or post-operative um, chemotherapy. Uh, for stage 3A patients, some of these patients are also operable and we would often follow those patients with um, surgery after surgery with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Um, finally, patients who have stage 3B disease um, are managed with a combination of multiple modalities of treatment, primarily chemotherapy and radiation. And for stage 4 patients, um, historically, it's really been um, a paradigm of chemotherapy for patients. Um, more recently, over the ten, last 10 years, with the advent of targeted therapy, for a subset of lung cancer who may have an EGFR mutation or ALK fusion, um, we, uh, we have um, had advances in the use of a targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy, but that really represented a small subset of uh, patients. And really it's been chemotherapy um, that's been the kind of the mainstay approach for advanced stage uh, patients. 
uh, bevacizumab or Avastin has improved efficacy, as has Remisurumab, anti-angiogenic treatments. Um, but those gains have been um, relatively modest. Um, it's been, uh, I guess, a little over a year now when um, um, Science Magazine um, noted cancer immunotherapy to be the you know, breakthrough of the year um, for this um, um, esteemed journal, um, really based on the advances and how we've been able to treat cancer patients, not just lung cancer patients, but more broadly, um, a whole host of different tumor types are um, being um, affected by um, this approach and, and lives of, uh, are being changed, not just of lung cancer patients, but many different types of tumor types. Um, when we think about um, immunotherapy, uh, it's important to really remember that you do have an immune system. Your immune system should recognize these cancers as foreign and uh, be able to destroy tumors. Um, and the primary kind of mediator of this um, immune response is called the adaptive immune system. And uh, the adaptive immune system is different from the innate immune system. Um, and that it has specificity and memory. So what happens is when uh, um, you have um, anything that's foreign really that's in your body and that would in the form of cancer, that would be a, D, a, a cell which has a DNA damaged um, um, to, to it and the, um, the different DNA sequence within a tumor from your own body's DNA sequence should be recognized as foreign. And so the innate immune system would respond immediately um, as sort of the first um, sort of bell that may go off and then um, subsequently the adaptive immune system will work with the innate immune system to destroy the cancer cell. And so if you want to uh, maintain that destruction, you need to attack the cancer specifically um, and you also need to have memory T cells. So for example, if you have re-exposure to um, a viral infection, you should have memory T cells that are present that can activate and so you don't develop that infection and hopefully that should happen with cancer cells um, as well uh, but when the immune system breaks down um, these new therapies that we are so excited about um, are likely to reinduce specificity to the tumor cells as well as hopefully memory so not only are we trying to shrink tumors but able to induce uh, a more durable um, shrinkage of tumors where memory T cells can maintain um, that um, recognition of those cancer cells as foreign. So if the immune system works, why does it stop working and uh, how does it stop working? Well, um, there's really three kind of sort of pillars of um, what may happen and uh, in, the, in the first um, you know, scenario um, is really elimination uh, where uh, what I already talked about where T cells will work to destroy cancer cells and that's an effective immune response that occurs when cancer and immunosurveillance is intact and you don't even see cancers that are developing in, in someone like this and I'm sure that happens in many many of us where a cell may become mutated your immune system works and it's destroyed. Um, over time an equilibrium can form where the immune system for whatever reason doesn't destroy every cancer cell and there may be some cancer that's persistent it may be dormant um, there's some sort of sort of um, sort of balance between your immune system keeping things in check uh, but not eradicating the cancer cells fully the problem arises when um, cancer cells truly escape the immune system and cancer is progressed and this can manifest through a variety of different ways where um, the immune system fails and um, uh, we now are able to um, reactivate the immune system in a subset of patients by these immune checkpoint blockade therapies and shift the balance uh, back towards the elimination of the cancer cells. Um, immunotherapy for, for cancers um, has been around in, in various form for many years. Um, really the first um, advance I think has been made in terms of discovering dendritic cells, developing antibodies, um, T cell therapies, and really the first immunotherapy to be approved was uh, BCG for bladder cancer, um, interferon for melanoma. 
Um, and the discovery of the immune checkpoints was really in the late 90s, and it's taken um, this amount of time to really um, develop uh, these drugs in a, in a, uh, for patients. And the first checkpoint was really in 2011 when ipilimumab was approved for melanoma. And now we fast forward to 2015 um, for lung cancer. We now have nivolumab approved uh, for lung cancer for both squamous and non-squamous lung cancer after failure of first-line chemotherapy. And we also have pembrolizumab approved for pd one uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so the immune system can be um, uh, shown here where you, you, know, you have um, cells which um, are really uh, pluripotent and can differentiate into um, a variety of different um, cells um, through into myeloid cells, into um, lymphoid cells. It's really the lymphoid compartment that's of importance to us. And the T lymphocytes can differentiate into um, natural killer cells, um, B lymphocytes, dendritic cells. And it's really um, one subset that's uh, been, been, been noted to be important are really um, these uh, four subtypes here. And it's really uh, the killer T cells that are primarily activated by immune checkpoint blockade, the CD8 positive T cells. Um, but also what are important are the helper T cells that can help um, work the, T, the killer T cells to work better. Um, and what we want to get rid of are the suppressor T cells that turn off the immune response. So, um, so when we use our immunotherapy approaches, we want to turn on helper cells, turn on killer T cells, and, ki and turn on memory T cells. So these um, killer T cells um, are also called cytotoxic T cells. They really um, destroy any abnormal body cell, whether it's a virus infected or cancer cells. Um, a subset of these T cell, uh, killer T cells are natural killer cells, um, which uh, are different from cytotoxic killer cells in that they don't need to recognize a specific antigen, whereas um, traditional cytotoxic T, um, T cells require uh, recognition of a specific um, normal antigen. So this is the, um, um, this, this, this slide is Cancer Research Institute's fault. So they wanted to uh, uh, put Dexter in showing, uh, and basically Dexter is a form of killer T cell um, and um, how we can harness Dexter um, to uh, destroy cancer cells and uh, not humans. Um, and how we can do that is by turning on the T cell response. And that's shown here where tumor antigens are um, really shed by tumor cells and to and process to form these little um, particles or peptides and um, these uh, dexter-like serial killer cells um, are turned on um, to attack, um, attack uh, tumor cells. So what we know is that these dexter killer T cells um, recognition of these cancer antigens is not adequate. And what you also need is a second signal or this activating signal, uh, and primarily it's um, CD28. So uh, what happens is a T cell will recognize um, a cancer cell as foreign um, by the peptide that's released into the bloodstream, but then you need to turn, turn it on um, with CD28 to make the T cells really go. The problem is, is that in cancer, uh, these inhibitors such as CTLA-4 and PD-1 um, turn off this immune response and don't allow um, the, um, the, the um, T cells to work. And it's really these immune checkpoints that we are trying to shape to drive T cells to, towards an immune um, response. And this can be done in various ways. Um, vaccines have been around for, for many years and um, have really not been so successful um, to date for various reasons. That, we can talk about in the um, uh, question period, um, adoptive cell therapy, um, which has been successful, but is very patient specific and requires a fairly um, onerous process of removing T cells, expanding them, reinfusing them, um, giving patients conditioning regimens to allow these um, T cells to be um, infused. Um, and then finally, the immune checkpoint blockade or immune modulator therapy, which we'll talk about primarily today. So I think you can think of your immune system as a car, and the checkpoints really function as brakes or accelerators. Um, PD-1 checkpoints, uh, what they do is they allow you 
to take the break off the um, immune response and allow um, the immune system to, to activate. Um, some of the newer um, drugs that we're working on um, in terms of immune checkpoints are, are actually um, can put the foot on the accelerator as well. Um, so as we look to the future, we might be able to do two things, put, uh, take our feet off the brakes, but also put our foot on the accelerator. So our, our future research is really to um, use these combination immunotherapies to um, um, allow um, basically a faster T cell. So, um, you know, what's, what's really very exciting is the notion of a long-term cure for the patients um, who have cancer. And ipilimumab, which has uh, been around for the longest, is a CTLA-4 antibody, which has shown uh, benefit in uh, patients with melanoma. And we actually now have 10-year data in a subset of about uh, 15 to 20 percent of patients with melanoma who are treated with four doses of ipilimumab have um, um, demonstrated that they not only have a specific immune response to tumors, but also a memory T cell response where um, even after just four doses of therapy, those T cells are still um, functional and maintain memory and maintain um, a T cell response. And this can be translated into a long-term uh, durable benefit, which is uh, particularly exciting. So 2015 has been very exciting for lung cancer. Um, the, uh, in March of 2015, uh, nivolumab was approved um, based on a survival benefit over uh, docetaxel chemotherapy in patients um, with squamous lung cancer who'd failed prior chemotherapy. Um, in October of 2015, we had two approvals, uh, pembrolizumab um, in, in uh, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, both squamous and non-squamous histology. Um, but for the subset of tumors who express PDL1 expression, um, and there are commercial assays now from uh, both Merck as well as BMS, where one can determine the PDL1 status of a, of a patient's tumor with this um, automated, uh, validated uh, commercial assay that um, both of these companies have spent a great deal of time and investment in terms of uh, developing um, commercially. Um, Nivolumab was um, additionally approved for non-squamous lung cancer after failure of uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. So um, it is now approved for both um, squamous and non-squamous uh, patient population. Um, so this is the patient that I've treated, um, again, speaking to the potency of immunotherapy. Um, and she um, had fairly extensive disease, as you can see in the black here. Uh, spread to uh, multiple areas um, of her body. And this is after a PET scan after six weeks of treatment um, and uh, shows um, essentially a complete PET response. And um, now she's after, she's two years out now post um, initiation of um, therapy, um, showing a durable benefit um, um, actually off of treatment um, for, um, uh, for about a year now. So um, this was the first um, randomized data that was um, uh, presented um, and published um, earlier this year um, showing nivolumab in blue. And these were patients who had squamous lung cancer had failed first line chemotherapy and um, compared to docetaxel, uh, the median survival benefit was 9.2 versus six months, uh, one year survival of 42 versus 24%. But again, you know, the, the tantalizing part is that uh, there is this tail, this subset of patients, this 20% range, and um, hopefully which who will have a long-term benefit. Um, um, actually, our, our first um, trial that we um, uh, uh, did with nivolumab, we have uh, patients out longer term, and this tail um, with nivolumab is now out at about three years where we have about 20% of patients who um, are in a state of um, durable benefit out of three years. So our hope is that we are seeing this long-term benefit with these agents occurring um, as well, similar to the Ipilimumab uh, melanoma experience. So um, pd one as a biomarker has been um, useful in terms of uh, determining who, which patients may be more or less likely to benefit. And this shows um, a tumor um, with uh, PD-L1 expression uh, shown here uh, within the tumor. And you can see 
<clears throat> that this PDL1 um, um, is somewhat of a kind of a shield uh, because if you look at a stain um, of the same tumor here, um, you can see the T cells over here um, <clears throat> not being able to penetrate the tumor. So these agents hopefully um, can uh, release the, um, these T cells, uh, break this shield, and allow um, tumors to uh, be destroyed by the pre existing T cells. Um, the assay is not a perfect assay as we do see responses in both PD1 positive and negative tumors. And so, right now, I think it is a useful guide in terms of deciding therapy. But um, suffice to say, there are clearly patients who are PD1 negative that can benefit from this immune checkpoint blockade therapy as well. So, um, the trials <clears throat> that are ongoing in non small cell lung cancer and um, include approval of nivolumab based on these trials <coughs> in 2015, pembrolizumab in pd one positive patients. This trial um, did actually read out recently and uh, will be presented soon showing activity um, versus docetaxel in pd one positive to patients. Um, there's trials that are looking at third-line therapy with combination immunotherapy with CTLA-4 blockade with a pd one blockade in pd one negative patients as well as Dervalimab or pd one blockade alone in pd one positive patients and again Oak um, <coughs> or Tezolizumab another pd one uh, blockade therapy versus dose tax of chemotherapy ongoing as well. <coughs> so I think as we look to the future I think that the combination approaches will be um, really critical uh, to improving activity um, the slide that I showed you before with uh, the T cells and PDL1 expression, um, uh, both uh, there represents what we consider a particularly immunogenic tumor environment where those, those types of patients are likely to respond to single agent PD1 therapy. However, what do we do for tumors that have low levels or absent PDL1 expression? Uh, those tumors that don't have high levels of PDL1 and T cells infiltration. We now are, are as we are, a lot of our research is really looking at combination therapies that can convert a non immunogenic tumor environment to an immunogenic one, and how that can be uh, with different uh, therapies such as chemotherapy, combination immunotherapy, and really push the immune response harder uh, to get durable clinical benefit in those patients as well. There are a number of um, phase three first line trials that are um, ongoing with combination immunotherapy and lung cancer. Um, nivolumab and ipilimumab um, are being studied in combination as first line treatment versus nivolumab versus chemotherapy standard of care. Um, there are two phase three randomized trials looking at PDL1 blockade with CTLA4 blockade, dervalumab and tremolumab um, in lung cancer as well. There are um, a number of combinations of PDL1 blockade with chemotherapy um, and uh, bevacizumab in the first line setting. So suffice to say, there's um, a lot of excitement in, in combination immunotherapy approaches in lung cancer. And this shows um, some of the chemotherapy and immunotherapy combinations with atezolizumab, chemotherapy, and bevacizumab as well. So as we look to the future, um, there are trials in the first line setting with uh, single agent PDL1, uh, PD1 therapy, uh, pembrolizumab or nivolumab, and these are only in patients who are selected for PDL1 positivity. So choose the patients who are most likely to respond based on PDL1 status and give them first line treatment with uh, pembrolizumab or nivolumab uh, versus chemotherapy. Um, the first line trials we talked about, um, the Meditremi or the Nevo Ipi combinations, um, are probably two to three years away before they'll read out. Um, so I think the landscape of immunotherapy, um, the paradigm of chemotherapy first, then uh, chemotherapy second, then immunotherapy third, is really changing and we're moving immunotherapy into earlier lines of therapy and newer combinations of treat these, these uh, treatments. So I um, just wanted to provide an overview of immunotherapy, how these therapies work, um, how immune responses can be unleashed um, in the first um, part of this um, uh, discussion, and then really kind of um, 
let's move to really discussion about these therapies and uh, a dialogue about um, immunotherapy for lung cancer. Great. Well, thank you so much for that, Dr. Rizvi. Um, before I, there's some things that I want to drill down on uh, based on some questions we've gotten in the non-small cell lung cancer, but um, I don't think in the presentation you touched at all on other forms of lung cancer like small cell lung cancer and mesothelioma. Is there anything happening with immunotherapy in those indications? Uh, <clears throat> absolutely. I, I think that's an important point. Um, small cell lung cancer has um, been studied um, uh, fairly, um, um, I think that, um, well, one of the issues with small cell lung cancer has been that our initial analysis of small cell lung cancer um, was that most of those tumors didn't, didn't express pdl one And so it was a little bit different than uh, non-small cell. So uh, I think that, that uh, our initial research focus was really on non-small cell because they tended to have higher levels of pd one But um, in trials, uh, in particular with nivolumab and ipilimumab trials, we actually did see, irrespective of this pd one expression, that there were responses not uh, with single agent nivolumab, but actually combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab. So um, there was about a 15% response rate with single agent nivolumab and a 30% response rate with combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab. And those combination therapies are, um, are actually in, in, in trials now, um, larger randomized trials um, looking at um, that combination. Um, I think that that's particularly exciting because um, really over the last 20 years um, there has been no advances in small cell lung cancer with any targeted therapy, um, anti-angiogenic vaccines, um, and so the idea that these therapies can really move the needle and help uh, patients with this um, uh, difficult cancer and hopefully um, have a durable benefit I think is very exciting. Um, similarly, with uh, mesothelioma, we've seen responses with uh, tremolumab as a single agent in mesothelioma. Um, there's data now with pembrolizumab and other immunotherapies in, in, in meso. So um, those uh, trials are also underway in those other thoracic malignancies. That's great. Um, I, I want to. Uh, I noticed in in the slide that you showed on uh, other phase three trials that are currently underway. Um, four of the six of them has had as a primary endpoint progression free survival, and in the Checkmate 057 trial, um, we saw that um, the docetaxel arm actually had uh, longer time to progression than the uh, than the nivolumab arm. So, can you explain? what that means and, and what its impact was on overall survival, which was reversed. The overall survival in the nivolumab arm was better. Um, so can, can you just say a little bit about that? Sure. I, I think that, um, I mean, I think that there's, there's different um, ways that one can interpret that data. Um, I think that, first of all, um, you know, some of these immunotherapies don't behave the same as chemotherapy, where um, it does, for some a subset of patients, it may take a longer period of time to activate the immune system. And so we do see patients who have sort of slow but gradual benefit over time where it may not be, be easily recognized early on in, in the analysis. Um, the other similar to, similar to that is that there's this notion of pseudo progression that can occur. And so when we do these CAT scans um, early on, there can be um, a subset of patients where uh, by scan they, their tumor looks bigger, but um, it could be that it's really the T cells that are infiltrating the tumor, um, inflammation that's occurring within the tumor. And by scans, we, you know, we can't really tell what's in there. Is it T cells or is it tumor? Um, and so it just looks bigger, but we don't know uh, what, what, what's bigger. And so some of those patients may actually look like they've progressed early on, but if you follow them out longer, they um, later begin to regress and, um, and catch up with the scans uh, in terms of what's 
getting rid of the T cells and, and uh, getting rid of the tumor. So I think late response, um, pseudo progression are I think both components of that. Uh, so are you saying that you're not worried about the trial designs that have progression free survival as endpoints? I mean, does that does that run the risk of, of making the trial look like a failure if progression free survival is the endpoint? Um, I think that um, you know, I think that uh, a number of the, the the trials that are you know using time to progression as an endpoint are not just single agent unselected therapies. Um, I think that there you know there are clearly patients who you know who don't seem to benefit from single agent therapy. So if this uh, drug helped everyone as a single agent, you know, um, you know, we'd be home free. But I think you know. Um, some of that early drop off, you know, there's some component of those as patients who aren't benefiting as well. Um, so I think that those trials, you know, going forward, where they're immunotherapy combination, so you're driving the immune system harder, chemotherapy combinations, or PDL1 selection, I think that um, I'm not uh, um, as concerned that uh, time to progression will be a problem. I think that. I think that um, with the combinations, with PD-01 selection, I think that time to progression will be an important um, endpoint, and these drugs will mean that, meet that endpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And uh, let, let's say I'm a lung cancer patient, and um, I've, I've get, been treated with chemotherapy. Uh, I've now been treated with uh, an immunotherapy, uh, an Opdivo, for instance, and I fail that, what are my options at that point? What do you say to patients who've, who've tried the immunotherapy and their cancer continues to progress? So I think for, for patients, you know, for patients like that, um, and, you know, I think that, that um, the first question needs to be, you know, make sure that it's true progression. You know, we don't want to take people off trial too soon for pseudoprogression. Um, typically, for patients who progress on immunotherapy, you know they don't feel they feel that their you know their their symptoms may be a little bit worse. So, uh, for patients who may be having pseudo progression, they actually feel potentially better, or they don't aren't symptomatic. So, I think you need to make sure to define true progression for patients that that progress after um, you know single agent PD one um, nivolumab or pembrolizumab. Um, you know, I think that uh, those patients very well could respond to chemotherapy as, as a third treatment. We, we definitely have anecdotes of patients who may have responded better to chemotherapy after progressing on any immunotherapy, so maybe there was some synergistic effect by getting the immunotherapy second. Um, we're, we're also doing trials with um, combination immunotherapy, including nivolumab, ipilimumab, um, Medi-4736 Medi or Devalumab um, and Tremolumab and other immunotherapy combinations in those PD-1 failures. So um, I think that uh, um, definitely we're, you know, we uh, haven't forgotten those patients who may be immunotherapy failures and are really thinking about what's next for, uh, for that patient population. So immunotherapy, um activates the immune system, which is, of course, a very powerful thing. And when it's overactive or if it goes after the wrong targets, um, some negative side effects can result. Can you say a few words about the typical type of side effects that you might see in lung cancer patients receiving immunotherapy? So the good news is that, um, you know, most patients don't have a lot of side effects. Um, and uh, they may have a little bit of fatigue, a little bit of uh, muscle aches, a little bit of rash or itching, uh, but you know they overall feel quite well and, and uh, um, will often tell me they feel a lot better than when they were getting chemotherapy. So um, I think that uh, I think that's the good news. Um, the um, the 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 other um, the other important uh, news is that you know from the nivolumab phase three trials. Um, even though there's a certain amount of fear over immune activation, in both of the large phase three randomized trials with nivolumab versus docetaxel, there were actually no nivolumab-related deaths on that trial, which I think also is, is um, uh, very encouraging. Um, for patients that have more significant immune side effects, uh, which can be inflammation in the lungs, 
inflammation in the bowel, uh, inflammation in the liver. Um, you know, we've gotten quite good at treating those side effects. Um, it's important to recognize them early, um, suppress the immune response, typically with corticosteroids. Um, and in some patients, we're able to resume immunotherapy once we've taken care of those acute side effects. Some patients, we, we really can't go back to those in, immunotherapies. Um, the, one of the challenges for immune side effects is unlike chemotherapy where um, the side effects tend to behave more predictably in terms of when they occur, um, immunotherapy side effects can occur really at any point you know, during the treatment um, of, of, uh, of patients. And even if they come off for whatever reason, we sometimes see immune activation four months or six months later. So uh, definitely the treating physician needs to think about what the immune side effects are that can occur, not just, you know, for the first round of immunotherapy, but for any round of immunotherapy and um, order the appropriate tests and intervene uh, appropriately to, to take care of the side effects. But um, that is um, uh, an issue that is potentially um, gonna, going to be greater um, as we give immunotherapy combinations, which um, uh, basically uh, instead of one foot on the brake, if you've got two feet on the brakes um, and you're uh, stopping harder, turning the immune system on harder, um, we do see more side effects and so we need to be uh, more aggressive um, with intervention there. So with um you know, more and more immunotherapies receiving FDA approval and many more in the development pipeline, as well as the plethora of combination approaches. How does a patient and a patient's physician decide? How do, how do they decide together what course a patient should take with so many options? Well, I think, I mean, I think that the, what's been difficult up until this year is, uh, you know, doing these trials and seeing these responses and, and you know not having these drugs commercially available so i think that uh what's uh you know really awesome is that um you know we we finally have these drugs um available um broadly to patients uh um throughout the country and i think that's that's the first start um and like anything it's um you know it's a learning curve and we um, try to translate the research that we do um, on clinical trials to to um, getting drugs approved as quickly as we can, and uh, so I think that um, I think that uh, you know most uh, physicians uh, um, you know are, are, are aware of what's available in terms of immunotherapy and will use uh, um, drugs that are commercially available, and then think about what's next trial-wise and how their patients can get access to. Um, really, what's next? Okay, thanks. Um, so we, we I, mean, I want to switch gears a little bit here. We've we've talked a lot about checkpoint inhibitors, and with good reason. I mean, that's that's where a lot of the really exciting stuff is is happening most recently. Um, but there are other forms of immunotherapy, like adoptive cell therapy, vaccines, CAR T cell therapy. Is there anything, any any promising movement happening with any of those approaches in lung cancer? Um, I think that um, you know. I think that those are a little bit um, uh, more difficult, more less scalable in terms of um, application. Um, you know, adoptive T cell therapy um, and CAR T therapy. Adoptive T cell therapy, I think, is uh, you know, it, it uh, has its challenges in terms of you know requiring removal of a you know large tumor and 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 uh, selecting the T cells, expanding them, reinfusion, and can only be done in, in, in a very selective um, patient population. Um, CAR T cell therapy is more a little more scalable, but you need to know you know what the target is going to be to um, home the T cells to, and that's a, a little bit harder for uh, lung cancer. Um, so I, I think and, and I think vaccines. Um, may have a future, but that may be on a personalized basis, and that's um, still a work in progress in terms of how to identify what the targets are. So I, I think that, um, I think those approaches um, are, are going to uh, be longer to, to evolve. Um, what I think is probably um, where I see the most exciting excitement in terms of 
um, short term, uh, you know, kind of moving forward for immunotherapy is some of the agonist antibodies that we're working on. You know, we talked about how we can remove the breaks with uh, PD-1 and CTLA-4 blockade, but we're really uh, making some, some progress in terms of um, putting the foot on the accelerator um, with agonist antibodies that um, um, are in the clinic and there's a, a number of these agonist antibodies either on their own um, or in combination with PD-1 that are um, in the clinic now. I think that um, some of the vaccines are also showing interest. I do think that uh, PD-1 is probably going to be the backbone for a lot of these treatments and um, everything that we do in terms of agonist antibodies, vaccines, uh, chemotherapy, um, um, or even T-cell therapy, I think, um, I think that uh, PD-1 is, is, is where we're going to start from as a foundation and build from there. Thanks. Uh, we're, we're getting to the end of our Q&A, so I'll try to squeeze in one or two more here. Uh, we have a question from a lung cancer patient who says that uh, he or she was treated with nivolumab on a trial. Uh, all of his or her tumors responded for over a year and then went off treatment for about two years, is back on nivolumab, um, but only some of the tumors are responding, others are progressing. So uh, this patient is wondering if you can explain why the drug might be less effective this time around. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, again, I think it's a, that's a complicated scenario. I think that um, um, we do know that, um, that there can be um, discordant responses in different parts of the body. Um, even up front for patients getting nivolumab for the first time, we've seen tumors respond in one area and don't respond in another area or become resistant and grow. Um, and I think it probably, you know, has um, um, something to do with how immunogenic tumors are. And I think that um, there may be a, um, a population of those tumor cells that are more mutated, more immunogenic. There's other population which are um, less mutated and less immunogenic. So when you, and they, in different parts of the spread of the cancer can be different populations of those or different clones, as you, if you will, of, of the tumor. And so how immune reactive they can be can, can be very different. Um, um, thankfully, you know, for, for most patients, we do see um, responses in different parts of the body, um, including the brain. And, uh, but I think that um, for a subset, there may be some discordance and, you know, we may need to take a different tact for those patients. Sometimes we will remove isolated areas of progression or radiate them or come in with some sort of combination immunotherapy to drive the immune system harder. So um, it's, it's an important um, uh, question, the notion of kind of immune resistance and, and how we can handle that. And it's something that we're learning how to do. Um, talking about mutations, um, is there a difference in how, you know, lung cancer can arise for, for, for various reasons. Some we know, some we don't know. Um, when in the case of a carcinogen, such as tobacco smoke, uh, where you see cancer, uh, you see lung cancer cells uh, becoming riddled with multiple mutations over time and therefore becoming more immunogenic, uh, I think I've read that those cancers actually respond fairly well to a, a single agent therapy. Uh, is there anything else you can say about differences in response based on what we know of the origin or potential cause of, of cancer in various patients? I think that's an important area of research that we and, and others are, are trying to, to work on. Um, you know, we, you know, most of our patients um, are actually, you know, um, ex-smokers and, uh, you know, but there's, but the tumors still have the genetic damage and that's um, what these immunotherapies, you know, can restore the, the T-cell response to those genetically damaged tumors. So, um, you know, when we think about lung cancer, there is um, a group, sort of the majority of patients who have uh, like two thirds or three quarters that have had tobacco carcinogen induced tumors. And then there's the other quarter who never smoked and develop cancer for um, unknown reasons. And we do know that uh, the prior, you know, those with a tobacco smoking history 
they tend to have a higher response rate than those never smokers um, with lung cancer. So um, I think we're, you know, um, understanding that biology a little bit more um, as, as we go along. And um, um, I think that their paradigms of immunotherapy will will differ based on whether you're, you know, you have a prior smoking history and you may be a KRAS mutation, or if you're a never smoker, you have an EGFR mutation. I think it's going to be a a different paradigm of how we approach approach um, cancer. It's clear that lung cancer, it's not all lung cancer, it's just lung cancer, and there's different types based on histology, based on smoking history, based on um, gene mutation status. Mm -hmm. um, so the very, very last question before we wrap up. Um, can you can you just say, and this is an easy one, I, I would think, for you, uh, what is... Uh, or how is immunotherapy, you know, physically administered to a patient, and typically how long is a course of treatment? Sure. I mean, so the treatment is given intravenously. Um, it's given um, over about an hour. Um, nivolumab is given every two weeks. Pembrolizumab um, is given over um, three weeks. Um, and uh, you know, right now these drugs are generally given on an open-ended basis, and. Uh, you know, speak, speaking to what we were discussing earlier, I mean, we don't know when to stop these drugs, and if somebody's responding, it's hard to emotionally stop them. And um, so, um, I think that's another challenge for us to think about in the future: is you know, when do we stop these drugs? Um, we understand the schedule, but the duration, I think, is a little bit more challenging. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rizvi, uh, for those excellent, uh, excellent presentation and your answers. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all the questions asked by those of you who are uh, watching today's webinar. Um, I'd like to take a moment just to once again thank our sponsor, Bristol Myers Squibb, for their very generous support, which made today's webinar possible. Thank you, Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, you can learn more about how cancer immunotherapy is transforming cancer treatment by watching more of our breakthroughs in cancer immunotherapy webinars at cancerresearch.org forward slash webinars. And as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and will be available within a week on our website. Also, if you are a patient or caregiver, co-patient, interested in learning more about lung cancer immunotherapy, including available treatments that are FDA approved, treatments that are currently in development and in clinical trials, as well as how to connect to a clinical trial of an immunotherapy or to talk to a patient who has undergone immunotherapy treatment, we encourage you to visit our answer to cancer .org, the answer to cancer.org website, our patient and caregiver portal. Once again, I'd also like to thank our partners, Longevity and Free to Breathe, for helping spread the word about today's immunotherapy webinar. We hope that uh, members of those communities have found value in learning about immunotherapy today. So thank you all again. In the, in the meantime, uh, I encourage you to provide your feedback on today's immunotherapy uh, in the survey that you'll receive in just a moment as we conclude. And with that, thank you again, Dr. Rizvi. Thank you all for attending, and farewell. <laughs>